Hey there, I'm Mr. Terry, a high school history teacher. Welcome back to another History Teacher Reacts video. All right, this video caught my eye and it is titled, What Did Wilhelm II Think of Hitler? So Wilhelm, he was the final emperor of Germany, got yeeted out with World War I, and of course that paves the way eventually for Adolf Hitler. So the question is, what would this previous monarch be thinking about with this new guy, Adolf Hitler? All right, this video comes from the channel Knowledgeia. Thank you for recommending it. The original link is gonna be down below. All right, let's get started. Let's go. Before the devastating era of the Second World War, before the atrocities of the German state during such time, and before the man at the center of it all, there was an emperor and king who yeah. never could have predicted what was to befall his precious homeland. German Emperor Wilhelm II, additionally Willy. the King of Prussia, would be the final monarch. I have to call him Willy because <laughs> his cousin, Tsar Nicholas, the King of Russia, they would refer to each other that way. Willy and Nikki loved it of his kind to rule the German nation. His reign began in the summer of 1888 as he took both thrones in what he assumed was simply another typical secession. By the way, it's um, worth remembering that when he, took, um, when he took over, Germany was still a newly unified state. You don't go much further back and you get Bismarck, who's kind of seen as the, you know, um, uniter of the, of the common German state. So yeah, it's still kind of a new thing. But this would not be the case. Instead, Wilhelm was a peculiar monarch. While he contributed greatly to the building of the German Navy and undoubtedly helped to strengthen the contemporary German state. Very similar to kind of trying to carry on the torch from, uh, um, from Bismarck. Although, wasn't it uh, the famous Bismarck saying that it was about the Balkans, right? It was like, you know, a world conflict is going to start from the Balkans or something like that. And almost like like urging future leaders, don't mess with the Balkans. I forget what the exact quote was. Um, let me know if you know down below. It's a great one because that's exactly what happened going into World War I. The emperor and king was not always well liked by people in and outside of his empire. His yeah. questionable foreign policy maneuvers were even bad enough to often be blamed for stirring up enough tension to yeah. eventually contribute to the outbreak of the Great War. That's what they this, said. Whether it was too fair aggressive. Or Germany not, was too aggressive. Would domino into the ultimate demise of Wilhelm himself. After Germany's defeat and internal collapse following the conclusion of World War I, Emperor of Germany and King of Prussia Wilhelm II was forced to abdicate his power in full on November 9, 1918. This alone left the Emperor bitter and resentful as he fled his of... home and country for exile in the Netherlands, the Netherlands, swearing to never return unless and until Germany would yet again become a monarchy. Germany was now <laughs> well, a yeah, like, why else would he return? <laughs> Just go go retire on some farm somewhere, right? Like, hey, I'll come back. But you gotta make me king again. Republic, the like, Weimar no. Republic. Bro. And Wilhelm was having none that, of it. And that didn't and last apparently, long. Apparently, soon, neither would none other than Adolf Hitler. In stark contrast in nearly every other way to Wilhelm, Hitler was not a supporter of the former monarchy and quite frankly found the deposed emperor to be a disastrous failure of a leader. Still, the up and coming political juggernaut wasn't satisfied with the Weimar Republic either. He and his party had first attempted a disappointing rebellion in 1923, yeah. which fell flat on its face. You know, um, also inspired by the sort of rebellion, if you want to call it, the year before in Italy under Benito Mussolini, where his group came in, overtook the government, and took power. Adolf Hitler's group, the, you know, uh, still newly forming kind of Nazi party, uh, tried to do the same thing, but to epic failure. But by 1932, but did create a lot the of economic instability and overall chaos of the Weimar Republic pushed people to back the previously unpopular Adolf. Yeah, I mean, the, the Weimar Republic was kind of doomed, uh, a very fragile democracy that inherited the problems of uh, World War I, the, the reparations, you're going to have the Depression starting, which started much earlier and to a greater extent in Germany than anywhere else. Uh, doomed to fail almost from the beginning. In a stunning change of tide, the Nationalist Socialist Party catapulted to the top, Not becoming real stunning, the largest to be honest. political party in the German parliament. It was, it, was, it was a growingly popular populist movement at a time 
of desperation, uh, which was appealing to look how many uh, political parties there are. See, but that was that that had to grow slowly through the 1920s, though, because you know Hitler doesn't come to the power until the 30s. Seizing this opportunity, Hitler rose to power in 1933, becoming the Chancellor of Germany that January. This Ceremonial was the point position. of no return and the start of the dark era to come. As Hitler swiftly invoked Article 48 and passed the Enabling Act in an ingenious yet tyrannical attempt to bolster his own power and authority, Wilhelm remained abroad in his Netherlands home. Yeah, what did he but think? While no longer living in Germany, the former monarch was far from disconnected from the German political realm. Now, at this point, it's important to keep in mind that Wilhelm himself was beyond disliked. By many, he was hated. Some viewed him as the incarnation of evil, and countless allies and <laughs> Axis alike blamed him for much of the Great War. The I mean, we know, we know the, the Treaty of Versailles put a lot of blame on Germany, right? When there's so much blame to be spread around. Um, but yeah, uh, th that was kind of the general thought coming out, especially, especially by the allies that of all the powers, it was Germany that was the most aggressive one, right? Not holding back Austria or, you know, invading into Belgium, a neutral nation and, you know, getting involved in that and declaring war on everybody, uh, which they just threw out. The yeah. British people, for example, so badly wanted to see the once powerful monarch executed for all that had happened, in their opinions, due to him alone, that his own relative, King George V of the United Kingdom, all refused all cousins. to speak out in his defense. You didn't know that? <laughs> King of England, Germany, Russia, all cousins, grandmother, Queen of England. So, um, yeah, World War I was very much a family affair. And you can kind of see, I feel like you can kind of see it in them. Like George, I, like the eyes, I see that with Nicholas a little bit. Um, I, I don't know, I, you can see it, you know. Anyway, but yeah, uh, he's chilling in the Netherlands now, which was a neutral country this time, but not going to be uh, eventually because Germany will, well, Adolf Hitler and the Nazis later are going to invade the Netherlands. While some other world leaders did defend the humiliated Wait. German, there was no denying just how hated Wilhelm was. The former emperor, on the other hand, Nobody was also bitter really, right? and angry about the recent events of the world. And he was more infuriated by the fact that all fingers seemed pointed unjustly at him. And this injustice, <laughs> as he saw it, had gone so far Everybody as to rob me. him of his titles and power. He had to watch his monarchy implode and be replaced by a shaky republic that he had no sympathy for. And then, as he eyed Germany's political situation continuously and intently, hoping and praying that soon he would have a moment to pounce and reclaim his throne and state, he instead had to watch as one man took his homeland on a gloomy, dismal path. A uh, question for you. Do you think it was pure delusion that Wilhelm could potentially be restored to power? I mean, is this going to be like like the restoration of monarchies that happen after the Napoleonic Wars? No, especially not when those that are in charge of the change don't want it. Possibly the first point at which Wilhelm developed a strong opinion about Adolf Hitler was during the failed 1923 revolt. While the efforts were quickly stamped out, Wilhelm was gravely suspicious of what the motive had been. Potentially unaware that quite the opposite was true, the deposed monarch thought that it was the Bavarian House of Wiedelsbach who was behind it all. His hmm. theory was that they were in fact aiming to rebuild the monarchy, but with the House of Wiedelsbach in place of his own. But this was never the case. Okay, I was going to ask if anybody that knows a little bit more about this than me, if that was a legitimate um, conspiracy or whatever. Nonetheless, the acts of the future chancellor were condemned by the former monarch from the very start. Still, Wilhelm made the mistake of thinking that, in any context, Hitler meant to restore the monarchy. In reality, the nationalist socialist leader had no intentions of doing such a thing, but he sure went far to pretend that he did. In January of 1931, hoping to rally the support of monarchists, the soon-to-be chancellor sent the World War I veteran Hermann Goering to meet with Wilhelm at his home in the Netherlands. The meeting was short and tense, and That's it only seemed to deepen Wilhelm's to mistrust in the new German party. However, Goering did return the following year, at which point he stayed for an entire week with the former monarch, and many within the party believed that they may have won him over. 
Quite contrarily, though, Wilhelm mm. hadn't budged. He regularly warned his family to stay away from this party, and his view of them and their leader remains negative. It wasn't just because they were against the monarchy either, as Goering Gehring. had even dishonestly told Wilhelm that he and his party in fact did want to restore it. Adversely, it was much of the party's foundation and policies that Wilhelm disapproved of. Like For what? one thing, as much as he tried to understand the concept of National Socialism, he just couldn't swallow it. In his own words, this socialism is irreconcilable with the idea of the national. Mm, interesting, because you're combining this nationalism, these ideas of German socialism, whatever you want to say, the type of socialism that they're talking about here and saying they're, um, yeah, irreconcilable. And that's what a lot of people have said about the whole idea of national socialism is like trying to trying to market it as a way that appeals to like these nationalists or socialists or anything or anybody like that and, and trying to do that well while in essence it was a very it's a different thing like they're turning into something very different right kind of weaseling it it's almost like all these different beliefs into something that would hopefully be great for marketing but then german nazism is german nazism it's very different than any of the and then any of those uh, philosophies. Additionally, Other than, I mean, it's extremely been accused of at a minimum making anti-Semitic remarks, he was far from the raging maniac that Hitler was. Upon seeing the Third Reich's treatment of Jews, the exiled ruler was appalled and disgusted. Mm. In fact, he was so repulsed that he said for the first time, I am ashamed to be a German. You heard about the Holocaust? Nonetheless, there were moments when Wilhelm attempted to give praise to the Chancellor. That's definitely, I think, one of the questions we'd all be interested in is, you know, what did Wilhelm think of the treatment of the Jews? And it would take, you know, somebody very uh, extreme to be supportive, I guess, of what they uh, what they were doing there, especially if you were now an outsider, like Wilhelm is. Although, now. maybe a bit backhandedly at times, in between the former monarch's attempts to fully cut any potential ties between himself and the Nazi regime, he gave honest praise to the good that the Third Reich accomplished within its own borders. A lot of people did that. I mean, Americans did that in the 1920s and stuff, then into the 30s. Hitler was a, a very popular figure amongst a lot of people. He was strengthening Germany. He was getting them out of their depression, um, had a lot of support. I mean, you can you can see this stuff in the press uh, around many places in the world. Not not a um, not a rare thing to see Hitler's uh, foreign support early on. And he even sent a message to Hitler himself after the successful job, defeat man. of the French. But the letter was only partially complimentary. Although he gave congratulations, <laughs> Wilhelm also made sure <laughs> to also refer sucked. to the troops who had fought for the Führer as his own. Which yeah. predictably annoyed Hitler, who labeled the old royal as an idiot. This was well. I mean, this is kind of part of what people use as features of fascism, where you have these, uh, these, these police forces that are loyal to, like, a political party, rather than maybe the state. Um, you know, you have that. Like, that's a different thing. The 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 German army versus like the SS or something. You know, you know what I mean. Like having a difference between the two. And fascists have that. They have those that are just like militarily loyal to their party, not necessarily of just whoever is in control. Like you have a German army and they're the army no matter who is in charge of Germany, right? But then you have those devoted because of the, the like the, the political party. It's likely the Which last contact between the two men. As Hitler Wilhelm them buddied idiot. up to the guards who by now were stationed around his Netherland home due to the German occupation, Hitler was busy with the war and had maintained not an ounce of compassion for the ousted monarch nor his supporters. That would be interesting to, 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 to learn about here is when Germany does invade the Netherlands, what was going on with Wilhelm then? Nevertheless, the chancellor was, was threat, far from was he, stupid you know, and heavy-handed with manipulation. Hence, when Wilhelm inevitably passed away on June 1941, German authorities saw this as a wonderful gift. Not only was their longtime rival and critic gone, but this was the perfect opportunity for a theatrical propaganda event. The plan was clear. Host an extravagant state funeral service in Berlin for the- Just like for Hindenburg before, show respect to the old people to what, gain support for those, or get support from those supporters? Right. Still give respect to Wilhelm, to Paul von Ben Hindenburg. He was the uh, president of the, the uh, uh, Weimar Republic, the guy right before. 
the once beloved and final emperor of the German Empire. Hitler was to play the part of the heartbroken successor, and an end to the era of the monarchy could finally be seen. The idea seemed easy enough to enact, until, that is, the final will of Wilhelm II oh, yeah? was addressed. Predicting the Don't, conniving schemes will, of no, nothing goes to Hitler. Don't give him any of my stuff. Of the Fuhrer, Wilhelm strictly forbade any such funeral for himself and directly stated that he was to be buried right where he died oh, wow. on his own estate in the Netherlands. Well, nobody did Thus, that. The opinion of the Emperor nobody of paid Germany attention. and King of Prussia, Wilhelm II, concerning the dictator that would follow was a combination of disgust, resentment, and overall disapproval. It also can be said that the feeling was very strong. Mutual. mutual. Two men at odds over the fate of one state, destined to live and die in opposition. Only the words of Wilhelm himself could sum up his disdain for the Chancellor even more clear. There is a man alone, without family, without children, without God. He Hitler. builds legions, but he doesn't build a nation. A nation is created by families, a religion, tradition. It is made up out of the hearts of mothers, the wisdom of fathers, the joy and the exuberance of children. Hitler Germany have any under of those. Hitler is an all-swallowing state, disdainful of human dignities, and the ancient structure of our race sets itself up in place of everything else. The man who alone incorporates in himself this whole state of personality. has neither a god to honor, nor a dynasty to conserve, nor a past to consult. This man could bring home victories to our people each year without bringing them glory. But of our Germany, which was a nation of poets and musicians and artists and soldiers. And a bunch of those were purged because they were seen as, you know, undesirables and Jews and all that fit that undesirable category of musicians and artists and writers. Which he has made a nation down. of hysterics and hermits, engulfed in a mob and led by a thousand liars or fanatics. <laughs> Interesting, if you saw, let me go back real quick, you can see the date of that in the bottom right, you can see that, uh, 1938, so this is uh, the year before the war. I mean, this uh, in 38 though, there was already the annexing of territories and things like that, so you could see a little bit of foreshadowing potentially, but like the real war machine is gonna be unleashed uh, in less than a year from this point. All right, let me give you my final thoughts. All right, hope you enjoyed that and uh, enjoyed some of my commentary and that. Um, that'll be interesting. A, a few pieces I can add definitely to my teaching um, a little bit about um, kind of connecting the different sort of eras in Germany of, you know, again, when you kind of look at Germany in the big picture, when you need to teach about kind of going that flow for the most part from, say, Bismarck to Wilhelm uh, to the Weimar Republic and von Hindenburg and then to Hitler, kind of seeing how all of those are connected and then also how that they're different. Being able to compare and contrast those, I think, is a very good kind of thing to take out. But as you saw, kind of the summary there was most of the things that Hitler was doing, Wilhelm was not approving of. You know, and there were small things that he thought he thought, you know, he was doing well and a little bit of taking care of the people, I guess. I mean, there wasn't a lot of specifics in the video of, of specific things that Wilhelm appreciated with Hitler, but probably mo more the uh, economic buildup and kind of uh, and, and, you know, um, reducing some of that hopelessness that did happen, uh, but was starting to see success in the 20s and then into the 30s and then up to that point. But Nevertheless, you still see somebody um, that was there. And I don't know if you can, if you feel any hint, do you think there's any hint of jealousy in a way? Because it did, again, seem like Wilhelm, like he was kind of talking out of both sides of his mouth where he's like, I'm done with Germany, but also he was like, but I'll come back if they go back to a monarchy, which is, if that's just completely self-serving. So overall though, um, again, if you've studied this a lot too, what do you think would be some more of the thoughts and more specifics about the Hitler and Wilhelm relationship or even just Wilhelm's thoughts of Hitler? Uh, I think that would be, uh, um, again, continue to be useful to, to, uh, to talk about. So let me know. I know a lot of you are big time experts out there. You love this stuff. So I want to learn from you too. So let me know down in the comments.
All right, again, this video link is down below. If you have not checked it out, subscribe to Knowledgeia, great content over there. Make sure you do that. And if you're down there in the description, uh, check out some other links to some of my other things as well. And with that, we'll see you next time. Bye.